It's not about slavery and sorrow. It's not about, oh, look what you did to me. It is about heroes who whose own advocacy for themselves and for their group of people that slowly changed this country over 250 years. Hello, welcome back to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we are revisiting the theme of Black history. Periodically, we've made programs that have looked back over our history to see what or who have been edited or, or omitted entirely from the record. Last season, we examined the history of Newtown, the original name for Cambridge, and in doing so, we unearthed some notable and unacknowledged local lives from the past. Today, we are again raising the question, why is it so critical for us, and especially our children, to grasp a fuller understanding of our history? Perhaps part of the answer comes from today's guest, Ray Anthony Shepherd, who chose the words of James Baldwin to open his recent book. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. After a career as a history teacher and a textbook editor, Ray decided it was time to create a book, quote, that didn't exist when I was in the classroom and I couldn't publish as an editor. His creation is an award-winning book, especially for young readers. It's entitled A Long Time Coming, and it uses story poems to profile the lives of six well-known heroes to chronicle the history of race in America. All of the subjects featured challenged and changed the racial barriers of their day, starting with Erna Judge, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, MLK Jr., and finishing with Barack Obama. Well, to help us explore the topic further, we're welcoming Professor Jude Law, uh, Jude Law, Freudian slip, Jude Nixon as a guest moderator today. Jude is a writer himself and a professor at Salem State University and former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So welcome to you both. Before I hand over to you, Jude, let me ask you a couple of quick questions, Ray, about the subject and the format of the book. You intertwined your academic research on these six visionaries with your own personal memories of your life, your mum's stories about her enslaved father, for example. What things did you learn by excavating this information? Well, the, first of all, there was always, well, no, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, what I learned or what, I grew up with the idea that there was slavery was taught in schools and slavery was taught at home and the two, and they were different. Um, my mother talked about her father, um, Anthony uh, Jackson, who was enslaved, he born in 1859 and emancipated when Missouri emancipated all of its slaves in, in 1865. He was six years old then. But my mother would talk about it almost with pride about how nice his father was, his, how nice her father's father was. He would carry him, he was a circuit judge uh, in Saline County. He would carry water to him. He uh, Mom would say he, he, treated, uh, she, he treated her daddy well. Um, and I was always in the con uh, trying to understand how is it possible that this man enslaved his own son. And it had nothing to do with what I was being taught in elementary and fifth grade American history. And so it was always that, that tension and that context, if you like, that didn't foot. And when, <clears throat> excuse me, and when we would go from Nebraska to Sedalia, where, where my parents were born, the you would be going back in time. 
in terms of you couldn't use the restrooms in the gas station. You couldn't sit in the movie theaters. Um, and it was always so different. And to, to me, the books were totally inadequate. Um, you also taught with books that you felt were inadequate, I imagine. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, one was called the, uh, and in fact, I ended up teaching it when I was an eighth grade teacher, uh, America Story, uh, Houghton Mifflin uh, published. Um, it was the popular social studies book or history book of that day. Did it feature, did it feature any history, black history? It might have had George Washington Carver. That would have been the most. <laughs> Definitely not Frederick Douglass or Harriet Tubman. Wow. So, and certainly not anything about the psychological or physical harshness of slavery. So in this book, you feature six prominent, um, well-known um, Black um, Americans. Um, would people perhaps say that, well, we already know about them. Right. Um, is that true? And secondly, why did you choose this format? To... Okay. Well, to answer your first question, the uh, people are, are readers, young readers, adult readers are very familiar with uh, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, and perhaps so, to some degree, uh, Barack Obama. Um, but the challenge for a writer is that you you tell old stories in new ways. So that gets to the format. So I have I'm trying to reach out and grab young readers 12 and i say 12 to 112 but primarily 12 year olds and up and i want to present them with a story that it's not about slavery and sorrow it's not about oh look what you did to me it is about heroes who whose own advocacy for themselves and for their group of people that slowly changed this country over 250 years. And so that's that's what I what I'm attempting to do. And I'm and I'll tell in I just add another. I also wanted to, it's a book, given my age, it's a book I want to leave for my grandchildren. So that they don't, because given what is currently happen, happening, who knows what will be allowed in schools and libraries. But for my grandchildren, who are quite young, in spite of my age, there's there's a there they have this very personal record of what it was like, and how and how individuals and their allies made a difference. You raise uh, a very good point because I'm going to ask you both because you work in education uh, about the teaching of the history of race and the legacy of race. But you you raise a point that that came back in our audience responses. I had sent out this question about is American history being taught comprehensively in American high schools and does it depend on where you live? And we had an overwhelming number of people in the responses that said, no, it is not being taught comprehensively. And it definitely depends on where you live, particularly two people, one in Florida and one in Texas. So already this has started, this um, um, modification, rewriting of facts, editing or elimination right. altogether. Right. So Ray, you work in education or you worked in education Right. Is the legacy of race in American history still largely misunderstood or, or missing? Not fully taught. I think that's what I would say. We no longer have the happy slave, but we, we, it's, not, it's, not, it's not taught with any depth. Um, so I, that's, that's my answer. And, and there's a reason for it. Um, first of all, the buyers of textbooks are public school school districts and states, and they determine what will be in the curriculum. And remember, they have to cover from as we approach America 250, they have to cover, you know, the Revolutionary War up all the way up to the 23rd, 24th uh, election coming. They're going to do that in a year for fifth graders. Uh, that's not a lot is going to get left out. 
And so A Long Time Coming is not a book to replace the textbook. Um, that would never happen. But it is a book for, for the reader who wants to go in greater depth. For instance, if they're doing a book report or if they're in, if they want to know more about I.W. Wells, they can go to that chapter and have come away knowing more than they would from any textbook if she was in a textbook. Well, I have to concur because I learned a great deal from this book. Um, quite honestly, it was illuminating for me. Um, now, um, Jude, you're in higher education. And I know you don't teach history, but you teach English literature. Uh, is is the history of race still largely missing or misunderstood in what you teach? Yeah, I would say um, probably more less misunderstood, not sufficiently representative. Uh, I think a lot has been left out uh, of it. Um, there has been a concerted effort on the part of some states to even begin the, the process of erasure. Um, we see that especially, I think, over the whole argument on critical race theory, which is obviously not well understood, and the sense of erasure also for guilt. Uh, there's a, there's a, in some circles a feeling as if you tell if you tell it truthfully, uh, it would lead to too much sense of guilt on the part of perhaps the perpetrators, and therefore let's not let's not deal with accusation and guilt. And so the more the more salient parts of that history, I think, is often often omitted. Um, but it's not well known. I mean, I I have a book in in on on the back burner, coming to the front burner, hopefully, you know, probably more more, more new now, and that is uh, race and the Victorians. And one of the things that is really not known is how eminent Victorian um dealt with race darwin is one of the very few exceptions for whom who was a, a really great advocate uh for abolition and the whole darwin family including the wedgwood the wet from wedgwood china um so yeah so i think it's it's misunderstood perhaps but i think not enough representative uh and in some cases um erasure um, I remember some years ago when I was teaching in Texas at the university in a class of 35 uh, sophomore students, four or five of whom were Hispanics, and I talked about the Battle of the Alamo in, in a section on point of view. And I said, I, you know, history told about the Alamo is very different if it's told from the point of view of the Mexicans and if it's told from the point of view of the Americans. And the, you could see the, the beaming faces of my Hispanic students in the class um, realizing that that's exactly how they sen sensed it and felt. We were talking about this earlier, about the definition of history, that it's not just facts. Right. No, um, and no. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Um, and I think that's critical. Um, um, so I'm going to step away and let um, Jude take the reins here and... Listen. So, so Ray, um, one of the things that struck me in, in reading your fabulous volume is over and over again, when we think, when I think that freedom is one, uh, I realize that it's not. Mm -hmm. And right. so my question for you is to, for you to talk a little bit about freedom as something contingent, perhaps equivocal, always in the process of becoming uh, never fully realized mm -hmm. and always to be fought for. Right. Yes. Um, there are many facets to, to freedom. There's obviously voting freedom or civil rights freedom that it doesn't take a Supreme court to rule that you can sit in an empty bus seat. There's economic freedom. And what we're, what we're over the decades, what we're up against, given the belief for the people, by the people, is all, it was always the question, who, who, are, who are the people? And so think about that slavery, Jim Crow, were supported by the majority of Americans, I could add white Americans, the great majority of 
white Americans saw nothing wrong with that. And it existed for for a uh, hundred and some odd years in sl- enslavement and a hundred years of Joe, Jim Crow until 1865. We're now in an era, we still have a long ways to go in terms of economic freedom or even political freedom. But we're now in, in a, an era in which the great majority of Americans believe in a multiracial democracy. Except we have a Supreme Court that judges are appointed for life. And we have electoral college where the only country president country with a presidential election in which the people actually don't decide who the president is going to be. And so that freedom then is always a moving target for mm-hmm. on a judge. It was personal freedom and she suffered dearly for it. Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, it was freedom for four million. For Ida B. Wells, it was freedom from the political violence of race. For King, it was the political um, freedom of voting and, and moving towards economic freedom. So it's always a moving target. And so... And one of the main purpose of what I wanted to do was to give young readers a sense of why racial justice is so hard to sustain. I suspect in the context I'm thinking of where we are right now with women's rights, democracy, all of the things that we for years assumed were given um, are things still to be fought for, still to be fought after, still to be preserved. And it seems a perpetual battle um, for these these right. values, yes? Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, it, a perpetual battle, perpetual. Mm-hmm. I think I end the book with uh, a line, you know, our perpetual failure to decide who the we and we the people. And that's what we're going to experience this year. Can you talk a little bit? You mentioned uh, in a, a few minutes ago, own a judge. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little uh, her story? It's an unusual one. Right. Uh, and not just, uh, but for her insatiable desire for freedom. But you speak of her be, as being deceived in a velvet cage. Can you talk a little bit about her? Maybe read one or two of the poems on her? Yes, sure. Um, own a judge was uh, uh, a dowered slave, enslaved person from Martha, Martha Washington. Uh, when she married uh, George Washington, she took about 200 enslaved servants with her, including Betty, uh, Ona's mother. Ona was born in, in Mount Vernon, and at age 16, she was, uh, as Washington was going, coming to New York to be president, um, uh, Martha took Ona with her and then eventually to Philadelphia. So from 16 to age 23, she is there and she's seen free blacks as well as enslaved blacks. And she's deciding and she's intermixing with um, AME church members. Um, and so she starts to desire freedom and, and she ma- comes up with a plan through the help of black and white abolitionists, she she steals away on a on a boat and rise to Portmouth, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she'll live for fifty some odd years, in spite of the fact that George George and Martha Washington will make two attempts to kidnap her. So, and it was a I wanted to start the story with showing the psychological harm. There's a lot of you know there's a lot about the whip and the scarring. But this this is something this is something else. In fact, I, as I say in the book, she had the best job a slave could have. The best job a slave could have, but it was not enough. And so the two poems, and I'll be very quick with them. Sometimes I, I, I sometimes I prefer to call them um, flash lines. Um, the flash lines of, of verse, quotes, and facts, 
But here it, here it is in Philadelphia, Velvet Cage. Here's what her life is as the, as the having the best job. And she thinks of herself as somehow as part of the family. After a day of traveling from tea to tea, making certain no hair was out of place, no spot was on her mistress dress. Ona helped the grand lady slip from her complicated clothes into a simple nightgown, ready for bed. Ona no longer thought Mar Martha Washington grand. She saw the blemishes and pockmarks of age. After a day of dreaming, of uh, uh, dressing and caring for the lady, addressing uh, caring for the lady, Ona returned to her room to stitch and mend before she could go to sleep. Outside the room, her velvet cage, she could hear freedom ring. They're right across the street from the Independence Hall or the Pennsylvania State Hall. And here's, here's her, this, uh, this is, this, my God. Yes. Okay. No, no. Okay. Um, my wife has given me pointers here. Okay. Deceived. Ona thought to be 21 was surprised by the president's generosity. He sent her to Mount Vernon twice a year to see her brother, her mother, Betty, who was further bent and spent by slavery's endless days. Free blacks pulled her aside, whispered, don't be fooled. If you're 21 and kept in the state six consecutive months, George, uh, you're free. George Washington was sending her back to start her slavery clock. So, again, what I'm trying to do in these flash lines, instead of a whole discourse narrative about the deception, um, about the Pennsylvania law and how Washington was aware of it and just trying to viola violate it, I, I try to capture it in a quick verse. You, you, you commented that uh, when Black history or slavery was discussed in Nebraska, in, mm -hmm. the, in the Jim Crow South, right. that you dreaded going to school. Um, why and what do you remember, remember most vividly? Well, I was at a, a, a school in which there were very few Blacks, given Nebraska, you would think you would recognize that. And this was a special school at the university for poor kids. And so I was one of the very few. And so every time when it came that time to we're going to talk about slavery in fifth grade or in eighth grade, it's amazing the eyes would turn and look look at me. And needless to say, it was uncomfortable. Yeah. And um, and I was still dealing with how is it possible my my grandfather could enslave his own son? I'm still, you know, as a nine or 10 year old, you're trying to deal with that. So did you, did, did you, uh, did you ever consider it as a, as a form of trauma? Well, it's a good, good question. Um, you know, there's some, there's some talk going on in, in certain intellectual circles about minor, m minor aggressions. Do they really rise to the level of trauma? My way of looking at it is, is these incidents repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, constitute trauma. And, you know, and, you know, I'm theoretically financially successful, professionally successful, and all that, but it's still there. It's still there. How do you, how do you, um, what would you recommend? How would you suggest ways of, of maybe getting over it is not really the, the right term, but, but some, somehow dealing with it? How do you, any, any thoughts on what suggestions you have? Well, for me, it's family. Okay. Yes. It's always about family. And in the African American community, it's always religion too, right? Right. And, 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 and yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So. Yeah. So, um, and 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 to recognize, you know, you're gone. You, you know, you've gone beyond it. Right. You've gone beyond it. Uh, but right. you you know. Right. You 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 know it's there. Right. And I suspect, along with the along with the church, there is obviously the music. Um, that is a major part of how to how to deal with it. Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, if you look at gospel music from right. from from the earlier days, it was it was a release. All right. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking along the lines of jazz. I'm thinking of soul. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of the way Nina Simone, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, talk, right. talks talks about it, or sings yeah. about it. Right. So, in addition to spending uh, time in the Library of Congress, pouring over yeah. and reading so much of the MLK files and FBI intelligence, uh, right. you vis you visited a number of sites, including the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, which with its four thousand dangling slates each inscribed with the name of victims of lynching. Right. And and they are only those we know about. Right. Uh, you are clearly telling an American history that in many ways remains untold. We have a picture of it, what it mm -hmm. looks like. Can you comment on what that experience was like for you? Well, it's one thing to write about it, to read about it. And um, I the research, the physical research I did, I before COVID was about Ona. So then COVID hit and I couldn't, I couldn't do um, the kind of research that I had to wait. I had to wait to after COVID when it was safe to travel. And again, um, there's no way you can be prepared for what you, for the emotions that you're going to experience. And I would say to our, our audience here, if you can only go to one civil rights museum, this is the one to go to. Right, right. Oh. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, take a look at it, there was an interview uh, some years ago, four, four or five years ago, on uh, I think uh, I think sixty Minutes did an interview where where um, Oprah Winfrey actually went there, visited mm -hmm. it, and spoke with the, the 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 chap who was responsible for establishing it. Right, uh, right. So, so if you, those of you who are listening and would be interested, you might want to do a, a quick search on Google for the interview with o Opal Wimpery. Uh, right. It's a, a lovely fifteen minutes um, story being told about it. And that's another example of um, when um, when Brian Stevens proposed to do this, went to the city council in Montgomery. The answer was no it would make people uncomfortable yeah 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 and now it is the biggest draw tourist draw if tourist is the mm -hmm. correct word mm -hmm. um to yeah. montgomery pilgrims 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 thank you <laughs> thank you uh the moving from owner to frederick douglas the uh the second section enslavement and emancipation mm -hmm. is is devoted to him and also harriet tubman Right. Uh, the stages of Douglas's li life uh, and his passages are remarkable. Denied first class cabin, despite his ticket having been paid for by the English Anti Slavery Society, who also paid a hundred pounds for his freedom. There were mixed feelings about this purchase, but it proved pivotal in the fight for emancipation. Would you say yes? Yeah, for sure. Because the abolitionists, some abolitionists who hadn't been enslaved, were saying it's a ransom. You're accept right. you're allowing. Yeah. Can you can you read for us perhaps one or two poems about Doug Douglas? Well, I'm I'm what I'm gonna do is I, I think the way you start a story as a writer, the way you especially for young readers, the way you start is critical in terms of grabbing their attention. So what I did with with uh Frederick and Harriet, I discovered the, which I didn't know at the time, the great similarities in their life. And so for the first time, their stories are being told parallel. So here's yeah. how I begin, here's yeah. how I begin that story. And again, my what I'm trying to do is I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give the reader, I want to give the reader a visceral impression 
of what Douglas and Harriet Tubman were up against. On Maryland's eastern shore, old Master Anthony added a slave child to his substantial property, as if a wobbly-legged fall or a newborn calf had dropped on the barnyard ground. As was the practice of the day, Frederick Augusta Washington Bailey's birth was not recorded, but the wise folks of Home Hill Farm best remember it before planning time in 1818. Give a take, give a year or two. Here's Harriet. Young Master Brodus added a slave child to his paltry property, as if a nanny goat or piglet had dropped on the barnyard floor. As was the practice of the day, a minty, minty Ross birth was not recorded, but the wise folks of Peter Neck District along Maryland's eastern shore best remember it as before planting time in 1822, give or take a year or two. So that's how I start yeah. the readers of seeing the parallel lies. They're born 40 miles apart, four years apart, and they're buried 60 miles apart in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a, an interesting parallel between uh, the Jewish exilic story and the African-American experience. I've just finished uh, my last book is on the dias diaspora, which goes back to the the, 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 the whole question of dispersion of people. And and you talk about Harriet Tubman as a kind of psychic who falls into trance and experience mm -hmm. premonitions, and she's regarded as a Moses. Why would you, how would you see her as a Moses in that exilic tradition? Well, first of all, it's in the religious tradition. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, we were talking about this earlier. She is a person of deep faith. Um, and, um, so, and, and the, the gospel that's the prominent gospel, of course, is go down Moses. Um, and so that's exactly what she does. She goes down many trips. She goes down to free her family. Yeah. And what, what I'm, what I'm doing in, th in that, in this particular story is saying why family was so important to her, and thus, if you like, they could expand it out to the Black experience. Because when she's first born, she watches the slave ca catchers uh, take her 16-year-old sister, Mariah, and move her down and, and sell her off down south. And so for her whole life, it's not, it's not that she... What, what's missing in school books, what's missing is, you, you talked about trauma, this trauma of having your sister sold makes you want to do everything possible to move your family up to New York or Canada. And so her trips are not just excursions, they are with purpose. And she does it repeatedly, doesn't she, Ray? Yes. She does. Yeah. 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 Uh, on, on the subject of trauma, talk a little bit about Emmett Till, the lynching, and, <laughs> the, and, the, and the effect it, it uh, had on you, the terror that it had on you. Well, maybe the best way to do it for each, there are three sections in the book uh, covering the major high water marks of american history there's slave enslavement and emancipation there's freedom and justice and then there's america today if you like and so and i start each with a personal history i reflect on my own my own experience so here's how i start a freedom and justice when i was 15 emma till a boy near my age spent summers with his people in a poor Mississippi town with a promising name, Money. 
on the on August night, two white men, as poor as a town, paid a visit to his great uncle's shack and dragged Emmett into the moonlight woods for a festival of gore. I spent my summers with my people in a small Missouri town with a frightening southern name, Sedalia. My hot black nights were haunted, knowing Emmett and I were of a race and age that neither family nor police could protect us from a night of moonlight rage. Oh, oh. I was I was struck always been struck by Emmett Till's mother, mm -hmm. who 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 at his funeral insisted that his casket be open. She wanted an open casket, right? Um, and and I th I suspect the argument is that she's wanted it because she wanted the evidence to be seen. She wanted him to be seen, not just the quiet rage, but how evil, in fact. Right. Um, his 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 death was, right. and and she wanted to sort of see the the, the, the visuality of it. Right. Uh, is it, and, talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, it, it, here's the story. So his mother's in Chicago. Um, she reluctantly sends him to visit family down in Mississippi. She's very reluctant to do it because he's grown up in Chicago, and it's you know. It's different. He's also someone who stutters. And his mom has taught him that when he gets excited or anxious to whistle. Mm -hmm. So when he goes to buy candy in this store, instead of putting the money on the table at the practice, he puts it in the clerk's hand, violating social mores, if you like. She then ac accuses him of something else, and he starts whistling, trying to calm himself, and then everything spirals out of control. Can you, can you even with that in mind, can you talk a little bit about the the black history as so much oral mm. and white history as textual mm -hmm. and the the conflict often between the oral and the textual the feeling that the oral is suspect it's not reliable right and that the textual is in fact truthful and reliable right. especially when it is sort of when it is canonized can you talk about uh, the, the oral and the textual as they're, as they're in conflict with two different groups telling two different histories? Well, as, as someone who writes biographies where you're, you're wedded to your research and discovering, and yet you have to accept that there are some given on a, on a judge only learned to read when she was, and then only the parts of the Bible when she was 60 or 70. Um, Harriet Tubman never learned to read. Um, so then what is it that you do? How do you, how do you, how do you tell an authentic story? Now there is, there's, there's a, a movement of foot in, in biography called um critical fabulation um that uh, Sadia Hartman at Columbia is, is looking into that uh, has written a book but what I tried to do instead of speculating I stayed close to the facts now so often the facts are from secondary sources as well as some uh, many from primary sources but I pieced them together as a way I uh, to tell to tell this episodic story. My 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 hero, I should say, in this entire book, is the next person I'm going to ask you about, Ida B. Wells, uh -huh. um, uh, a former slave in a lady's car who becomes an entrepreneur. Um, 
ownership of several newspapers. Um, can you talk a little bit about her? Well, well, Ida B. Wells is, um, at one point when I was trying to put together the six that wanted to cover all the benchmarks that I went from the founding of the country to the election of Obama, it was a question, who was, who was I going to, who was going to tell the lynching story? Was it Ida B. Wells or Walter White? Right. And I chose Wells because her, her life was more, I found it more interesting, more mm -hmm. dramatic. And I liked the, her, uh, I don't know, like her spirit, the way in which she would stand up and fight. Um, and what I, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read, if if I may. Please do, please I do. Want, I want to read something else to you. Okay. And re remember, my job is to hook the reader. That's my only job. The proper Miss Wells took a seat in the lady's car, smoothed her newly purchased skirt, adjusted her big hat, settled back for a weekend free of teaching out of slavery's children in a colored country school. As the CNO train clickety clacked out of town, the proud black teacher with exa exaggerated fanfare flipped open the afternoon paper. The sullen conductor studied her ticket, shook his head, continued down the aisle, returned with two others. Locked in memories of when the world was white, nearly two decades since the Civil War, not enough time to accept their world turned upside down. A former slave in the ladies' car? <laughs> uh, you mentioned in talking about her, you talk about white votes mattered more than black lives. Can you um, comment on that? Well, it's just a, her, you know, the whole fight to get an anti lynching right. law, uh, which just happened in the last few years. Mm hmm. Um, no republic, no uh, political party could would support it. Yeah, they couldn't get to the floor because it would offend their voters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and you can imagine you can lynch someone, um, but it's not against the law. It's not a federal law, right? And the response is, well, it's a state law, but the state always said carried out by people unknown. Right, right. So, um, talk a little bit about the NAACP uh, and its uh, Springfield, um, Illinois beginnings, almost uh, sort of a phoenix-like birth. Yes. Well, what you have is the riot, race riot of, in Abraham Lincoln's hometown, in which um, um, someone is accused falsely or not, we don't know. Of, uh, of rape is in a jail. The police officers have an obligation to protect him. They move him, move the, the, uh, the, uh, they move him out of prison to a safer place. The white people in town go um, attack the black community. They burn houses. They lynch uh, uh, two innocent, uh, innocent people. Um, and it, it is days before the National Guard arrives to calm things down. And they're saying, um, they're running, the vigilantes are running through the states. We will show you where you belong. Um, and so out of that comes the, uh, the NAACP uh, in 1919. And all the time now, Ida B. Wells is leading the fight or an anti-lynching law than making the English speaking world aware of it. But the NAACP has a different uh, approach uh, going for more of a legal approach. And they find that she's unacceptable to, to their, to, to their cause because one, she's from the South, she's dark skinned and she's a woman. And the NAACP, NAACP is basically light-colored, college-educated men. I, I like the way you used her to um, introduce um, Martin Luther King 
mm-hmm. with this with this like, where you move from um passing the sword yeah and and i i slashed i slashed next to it pen mm-hmm. because she's a, because she's a writer and and the the, the sword are, and the pen are really fascinating right yeah, you know i think shakespeare's was who said you can kill people in different ways right and uh with a sword but with a pen right uh and and you use the transition from sword slash pen to the torch can you talk about that transition yeah well in all the stories i i i, I link them together so that uh, they're not they're not just meant to stand alone right. so you can see this movement going forward and um you know uh with uh with king it is uh he's he's going to pick up where she left off yeah yeah he's going to, but he's going to, he's going to redefine it he's going to define it in in um in civil rights right right um to etc so that's 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 the reason but yeah, yeah my main purpose was to to link and for readers to see this connection right. not as individual stories but uh because again the book is about race told from inside the lives of six individuals right each of them were dealing with an aspect of race in their own era for those who haven't read it as yet, we you refer to it as a as a a small boy as Ida lay dying. A small boy in Atlanta, Georgia, was picking up quote Ida's sword, yeah. and that small that small boy is MLK Jr. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, while we're on MLK, uh, mm-hmm. talk a little bit about his being inspired by Gandhi. Well. Um... He's looking when he's at Boston University. He's looking for a way. He's not, you know, right now, at that point. He's still. He's thinking. Well, maybe he'll be a college professor, but he's going to. He's going to uh, have a congregation for a few years and then end up at a, a college, probably a black college, as a professor of theology. That's his his goal. So, and he's aware of Gandhi because he's always intellectually um, curious. And then when he's thrust in to the civil rights movement, into the bus boycott, he falls back on, and and his strategy is, you know, recognizing what's the best way to win? Um, What's the best way to succeed? And so this nonviolence is is his answer. If, If we boycott, if we walk for 365 days, if we allow ourselves to get beaten, if we allow ourselves to be bitten by dogs, the and he's using the media very skillfully. Um, he's turning public opinion against the Bull Connors of the world. Right, so, as as you said, the the, the bull that could not uh, what the bull that could not uh, strike. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit too about the transition from um one one model in Gandhi mm-hmm. and uh, a, a competing model perhaps uh-huh. maybe maybe side by side in Malcolm X not that one model right. is is better than the other I see them as sort of train tracks right they're parallel right. um and especially the poem you wrote I think it's on page 220 of your text yeah. Yes. Um, can you can you if you can find it? Can you talk about it and maybe read it for us? Well, remember, I grew up in the era of both Malcolm X and and uh, Martin Luther King. In fact, the book I'm currently working on is on Malcolm X. So, um, and he's born as I was in. He was born in Nebraska, uh, and I had the privilege uh, to hear him speak a few uh, months before he was assassinated. So it's really the question. So it's so here. Here's what I'm telling the kids. All right. So you're in a corrupt institution, and 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 really, you have you really have the choice. You can accept it. You can work to change it, or you can blow it up. Okay. So here's Malcolm and Martin. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr pose two different answers to a question as old as human history. How does a person, group, or nation fight oppression? 
retaliate and with, with aggressive self-defense or endure with love and pray that your suffering changes the aggressors. One action common, the other rare. Both take courage. Each believed theirs required more. Wow. Um, let's let's move way into the 21st century with mm -hmm. um, Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was struck when I was reading that section, you introduced him as Barry. And I want you to talk a little bit about how Barry becomes Barack. Right. And, and I'm reading Barry and I'm, I'm furiously, you won't believe it, turning the page, mm -hmm. page after page to find out who the hell is Barry. Uh -huh. And even though I sense it must be Barack. So can you tell us about this sort of right. mutation, perhaps, from right. uh, Barry to Barack? Yeah, well, first of all, one thing I did discover, if you asked, what, what are some of the things you discovered? Everyone of my six people changed their name. They took on a new identity. Right, right. Uh, Oni became Ona. Uh, Harriet became Harriet. Um, Ida, B, Ida B. Wells played with the Ida and wrote under a, a pseudonym of Loa. Um, Martin Luther King was born with the name of Michael, as his daddy was. Barry or Barack Obama had been growing up in Hawaii to be accepted. He's ra primarily raised by his white grandparents. The name Barack is unusual in the 60s in Hawaii, so it's shortened to Barry. And it's only after, through his childhood, when he goes off to college, and he's in his book, he talks about as a composite of a number of characters. Someone says, why, why don't you call yourself Barack? You're a real name. And that's, that's the change. And that's mer that's Barack emerging out of this mm -hmm. nebulous confusion of he's black, he's got a white mom, his father is missing, his grandparents are white, he's in Hawaii, he's in Indonesia. Who is this kid? I, I, identity, huh? Mm -hmm. Identity. And yeah. and in fact, in many ways, all these all these are search for our identity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I suspect search also for the real self, right? Self? The real self, yes. I mean, who self, am I? Yes. Who am I? Yeah. Who am I? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So who, so who do I want to be? Yeah, yeah. Who do I yeah. want to be. Or, or you know, who am I, right? Yeah. I mean, the essential question we all ask. Yes. So and, let me ask let me ask one last question, and then I'm okay. sure I'm sure there are a number of folks who would like to to ask some questions. While we are on the whole question of identity, it's a good place to ask the last one: Is that is it possible, quote in your words, to be black in America but not defined by race? And maybe you could read the poem Dena now at the very end of it. I think that that that's first of all, it's extremely hard. But yes is the answer. Yeah, and I I don't know which poem you're talking about. I'm sorry. It's uh it's it's called then and now. If you can oh, put then and now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll find it. But but the, I think the the thing to keep in mind is who defines you, and this is what we want kids to do. Right. Who defines you? You define yourself, and how do you go about it? And so. You know, um, I'm. Am I a black writer or am I a biographer? And regardless of what label someone wants to put on me, I still control how I'm going to react. Right. So that's 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 the search. That's the search we have. Okay. I'm. If you could give me a, you could give me a page number. I'm sorry, I was sure. I don't know if Mary has it. Um, I don't have. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, then and now, right? Yeah. Yes. Then and now. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now here, here, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. Okay. Here's what I'm doing. It's the inauguration, 2009. Thousands, thousands, in spite of the next president, thousands of people are standing in the code. I was and, there. I was there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so here you are. And what I do is take sweet land of liberty and summarize the whole book, the book. A new day dawned on a cold Tuesday afternoon. Sweet land of liberty rang from Aretha Franklin's church holy voice. My country tis of thee warmed almost two million land of the pilgrim's pride stretched from the capital to the national mall my heart with rapture fills floated a fever of joy across the world's screens of thee i sang the impossible made possible now made real let freedom ring Words Harriet Tubman refused to sing on Jubilee Day. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free her Maryland people. Now she's honored in the Military Intelligence Corps, Corps Hall of Fame for keeping the Union free. Sweet land of liberty, Ida B. Wells showed the world Jim Crow's horrors, now posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize the highest honor for journalism in the United States. Land where my brothers died. Martin Luther King statue stands nearby. Let, free, let the swell, let the swell breeze. Frederick Douglass statue greets tourists in the United States Capitol Visitor Center. Sweet freedom song, own a judge once enslaved in the president's house. Let all that breathe partake. Barack Obama elected to the White House. Sweet land of liberty, my country is for all of us. Ray, I haven't um I haven't had dinner as yet, but I felt I have been served quite a a delicious meal for the last hour. And I really, really want to, before I hand it over to Mary, I want to thank you for this lovely uh, pre-dinner um, treat uh, on this Tuesday. Mary? Yeah, I you. can only concur with that. That was superb. Um, and we even got a song thrown in, free of charge there. Very Quite nice. nice. Yes, I would suggest everyone buys a copy of this for the, themselves and for their grandchildren. And... Um, Will we all benefit from from reading? I, I must just come in with a couple of quick questions from the audience, even though we're up to time. Mm -hmm. To what extent are today's young people being damaged by the cherry picked history of our nation? Yeah. We've been here before. <laughs> this is just this is a repeat of what was here. And we recognize, you know, for Florida to say a black history AP advanced placement course has no educational value, but a European history course does. Um, I'm hoping that they can see through the shenanigans. Um, that is, you know, it, it, um, libraries and teachers are under tremendous pressure. And whenever I get, uh, when I'm asked to come and speak at the sc a school or a library, the first thing I do is say, here's what my book is about. Be sure you've read it. Make sure you're comfortable with this because the last thing I want to do is to cause a librarian or a teacher to lose their, their job. Um, there's something, I have this crazy notion in my head. Frederick Douglass had Sabbath schools you know, went on Sunday, he went out in the woods and he taught fellow enslaved servants how to read. And parents, white and black, need to make a concentrated effort 
I know it's a dream, but a concentrated effort to teach a full American history. Um, I, we become better citizens by it. Just like if I read enough Shakespeare plays, I understand his genius. If I read enough of uh, Willa Cather, I understand what she was doing. If I hear enough and experience enough of American history, I become a better citizen. Now, I know that's Pollyannish, and, but that'd be me. Well, I think it's a great aspiration. And I think if history isn't making you feel uncomfortable, it's not doing its job, the right. teaching of history. That's what I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, now, now, now think, let me just piggyback on it. Think about we want our kids to pass the, the, you know, the SAT, right? You don't think there's pressure and uncomfortableness with that? You want our kid to make the hockey team? You don't think there's pressure? Kids can handle pressure if structured correctly. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of very good comments. I'm just going to throw them out. There isn't really time to discuss them, but um, you you mentioned about being successful and mm -hmm. accomplished and mm -hmm. still having these deep-seated um, anguishes and angst attached to your to your youth, almost right. like almost in your DNA. Yeah, and somebody has said here, one of our vice provosts at North Carolina State told us from nine to five he's an accomplished man, but the minute he leaves campus, he's fearful driving home and being stopped by police. Yeah, I would hope there are books for parents to have the talk with teens when driving. Yeah, I think there are books there, but that's, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a reality that now I, we live in, I live in a bubble uh, here in, you know, Metro West. Um, we have a great police force. Um, but when I traveled, when I traveled to Atlanta, when I traveled to, to um, Mississippi to visit um, Ida B. Wells' birthplace. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was aware. Let's put it this way: you get in Montgomery and you see you're staying at a hotel that's built on a cotton exchange, and across the way are warehouses where slaves were warehoused until they were taken to the six slave markets. And so, that's not that's not that's not history. That's that's real. Well, I want to thank you both, both um, Ray Shepard and Jude Nixon, uh, for a wonderful, insightful and hope-filled discussion today. Um, and uh, thanks again for doing the book, Ray. It's, it's oh, a, yeah, yeah. a delightful book. Thank you and Jude. For, it was a, it was a um, treat. It was a treat, Ray. Well, I'm honored by, by this attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say a few words. Cambridge Forum is made possible by the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, and of course, all you good people. So if you haven't given to us uh, for a while or ever, feel free to go to the website uh, www.cambridgeforum.org and cough up. Uh, you can also sign up there for the free newsletter, uh, which tells us about programs and all sorts of other good stuff. We do produce weekly NPR broadcasts of Cambridge Forum and a video of today's program will be uploaded to YouTube shortly. Um, that's thanks to our good friends at GBH Forum Network. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us today um, and I look forward to seeing you all uh, in two weeks. Thank, thank you. you Mary. Thank you, Mary. Bye bye.